After Class Podcast. This is the second episode. Thank you very much for tuning in. Thanks for watching, uh, listening to rather the first episode. I hope you enjoyed it. People seem to like it. A little rough around the edges, but uh, I think it can grow. I think it uh, has potential, you know? My name is John Graham. I'm a YouTube star. Well, I guess I'm not really a YouTube star. I mean, I create, I'm a content creator, but I haven't raped anybody yet. So I'm not quite, I'm not quite at YouTube stardom yet, but, uh, one of these nights, you know, I'll just go a little crazy. (laughs) I've been debating whether or not to drink on this podcast, you know, before or while I'm doing this podcast, because I don't know, on one hand it's unprofessional, right? But on the other hand, it kind of loosens you up. But ultimately I thought, no, I'm not going to drink. That's unprofessional. I can't. So I am not going to do that at all throughout this show. What was what noise? I didn't hear a noise. I think you're the one who's crazy hearing noises that aren't there. What? I didn't hear anything. You're still hearing noises? You guys, you guys are insane. So my name is John Graham and I'm most widely recognized for... um, doing a series called Arby and the Chief on Machinima.com. And in the last episode, I talked about uh, school, grade school, from like kindergarten to high school, what, what it was like growing up, what it was like being in school, what I thought of it. Spoilers, I fucking hated it. You know what the worst thing about it was? It was just so boring. Like, so criminally fucking boring. It sh- everybody, all the teachers should be arrested. It was that criminal. I always thought I had a good imagination, and I loved, like, daydreaming and stuff and doodling and, like, writing stupid stories, but as stupid as they were when I was doing those kinds of things, I never thought for a second that I was wasting my time. Like, it felt productive because it, I don't know, it felt exciting because it was something I made, you know? And I felt school was just a daily six-hour fucking pain-in-the-ass distraction from that. This giant thorn in my fucking anus that I can't pull out for like 20 years. Awesome. But, you know, much as I hate to admit it, I'd be lying if there wasn't value in going to school. You know, because that's where I learned my ABCs. And I ended up being like a decent writer at a very early age. Like in grade 5, I was acing all my spelling tests and getting good grades on all my papers. And I was chosen to write like an article for the for the school newsletter about like a the experience of a field trip we all had I was always really good with words Scrabble has always been my favorite board game and I've always been pretty good at it up until recently I fucking suck now I used to draw comics in school in fourth grade a lot of the time when I should have been doing assignments but I didn't care fuck it I have no idea in hindsight what it was about or why I enjoyed writing it so much or drawing it so much, but I drew a comic in fourth grade, like a long-running comic series that nobody really ever saw except me and a few like close buddies at the, at the a few close buddies at the time. And it was about this like mute, bald, hook-nosed character who would get into these outrageous situations every episode and get like beaten and tortured and every comic would end with him going back home and going to bed and that was every final panel like it was consistently that and looking back on those it's like that was so weird why why did I do that what is this fixation with home going home going to sleep last episode I was talking about how my grade school experience was uh peppered with just one too many psychopathic teachers. I remember I had an art teacher in intermediate school, and I can't remember why or what he did exactly. I just have an immediate recollection of him being a huge douche. I don't know, I guess he came off a little smarmy or conceited, maybe. I remember one day we were, like, figure drawing, 
and he stood up on a desk and he did this pose and he made a gun out of his fingers and he pointed it to his head. And I was joking with my friend next to me that, you know, too bad it's not loaded. But I whispered it so the teacher couldn't hear. But the but then the teacher looked over at me and said, don't worry, it's not loaded. So I guess without even hearing, like he, he just like knew, figured based on what he was doing, he knew what we were joking about. And we just laughed. Another day, I guess I must have done something to piss him off. I can't remember what that was either. But I was in class one day and we all had to, like the class had to move to a different room for some, for whatever reason, maybe to go to the computer lab or something. And the teacher wanted to like leave a note in the classroom we were leaving you know, to tell, like, the janitorial staff something or whoever was going to occupy that room next. I can't remember, but he needed to put this sign up. And I was sitting at my desk in a chair at the time, and he walks over to me and he says, like, get up. So I get up and he takes my chair and he sticks it upside down in the sink and puts the sign on that, on the upside down chair to, like, hold the sign up. Like, what the fuck was that? Couldn't you just put it on the wall or, like, the door? You have to, like, take my chair, turn it upside down, and put it in the sink? Are you fucking... What is this? Is this passive aggression? Like, and then this touches back to my earlier point in the first episode about, like, you know, seeing adults get, like, worked up like this to such a childish degree. And then, you know, I'm, I'm getting pissed off thinking, well, who's really the child here? And, you know, I'm the one taking orders from you, and you're, like, doing this... Sh- you're pulling this shit... I've had some great teachers throughout my education, don't get me wrong, but just, like, some of them just do this. Some of them were just weird, you know? And, like, egotistical. And I remember that our teacher's wife was another teacher at that same school teaching another class, and she was, you know, she was considered one of those super bitch teachers, like Kyle's mom in South Park. I remember in early high school, one day, um... There was an assembly in the gym because um, some performers had come to the school and they were going to put on a show for the students. Um, I can't remember the context of the play, but I think it was some kind of anti-bullying, anti-drug kind of thing. Or it might have been just a comedy variety performance. I don't know. I can't remember. That's not really the important part. What is important is that um, before the assembly, I went to the vending machine and I bought myself a bag of mints. You know, I've always had a sweet tooth. I love candy. So I just bought this bag of mints out of the vending machine. And I go into the gym. And I'm sitting on the bleachers behind this guy who's like fucking jacked. He's like one of those famous kids among the student body who you don't fuck with, you know. And he was, uh... And that guy was a bit of a troublemaker. And, you know, the show starts. Everything's going well. And then that guy in front of me... He turns around and he sees, well, I guess he heard the rustling of, you know, my bag of mints as I was opening it up and eating mints. And then he turns around and he looks at the mints in my hand. He looks at me and he says, give me those mints, kid, or I'll blow a load in your eye. I was like, well, I definitely don't want semen in my eyes. So I better just give him the mints. So I just gave him the bag because I just figured like, He wants a couple mints, whatever. And so he takes the bag, starts, he pulls out a mint, and he throws it at the performers. And I think he missed the first couple times. But he keeps throwing one after another, and eventually one lands and hits one of the lead performers square in the fucking forehead. And it was a showstopper. Like the guy said, stop, everybody stop, stop. And then the performers addressed all the students in the gymnasium saying they feel really offended that they would have things thrown at them and they stopped the show and they left the school really disappointed and I I felt so bad it wasn't me who threw the mints it was this fucking kid I gave the mints to and I thought he was just he just wanted some mints I didn't realize he was going to be hucking them but that jacked kid I gave the mints to he gave me the empty bag afterwards so you know after the fucking assembly was over, all the the kids had left the gymnasium, and they're all like, there's all this chatter going on about, like, what happened? Who, did somebody throw something? Like, who did that? Who was it? What, what, what did they throw? And I'm, I feel like I've got, like, the smoking gun in my fucking hand with this empty bag of mints. So I immediately made a beeline for the bathroom, and I'm like, 
washing the bag in the sink, like cleaning it of fingerprints. As if they're going to get a fucking forensic team in to like dust the whole place down. We found him, sir. About halfway through my high school years, I moved to a different town, and that meant going to a different high school. And uh, I didn't have that many friends to begin with, but, you know, the friends I had were good. And then I went to having no friends. So that was kind of tough at first, but this was around the time I talked about in the previous episode where I kind of stopped caring what other people thought about me, and I just started trying to be my own person. And I always kept to myself. Like every lunch hour, I was either in the computer lab or I would just walk laps around the school all lunch hour, like over and over and just listen to music. So I didn't have to talk to anybody. Nobody would bother me. And the fact that people saw me walking around gave the illusion that, you know, I was busy and had some place to be. It's like, oh, that, that guy's on the way to something. Maybe he's cool after all. When, in fact, I wasn't. I had nowhere to go. I was just going literally in fucking circles until the bell rang and I had to go into fucking class again and ride that out until the bell finally rang and I could go the fuck home, which is all I ever wanted to do every day. Fucking leave me alone. Stick your letter grades up your fucking ass. I don't care. But uh, there were some cool things about um, that new school I went to. It was significantly less douchey, way less jocks. And uh, I finally had an opportunity to sign up for courses, you know, of my choosing. So one of those courses was a 3D animation course, and that's where I learned how to use... Like, I learned the basics of 2D animation there, where we had, you know, the transparent paper and the, the, the drawing boards that were backlit and angled, so you could, like, animate frame by frame. I did that, I, and then I... And then we moved on to 3D animation from there, and I would use, like, I used... Maya very briefly, but uh, what I used most of all was uh, 3D, 3D Studio Max by Autodesk. And that's the same company that does like um, blueprinting software for like architectural design. And I really enjoyed working with 3D Studio Max. I love trying to build realistic environments. I learned about spectral mapping and shaders, how to play with light and shadow. The various uh, dramatic effects that, that lighting alone could contribute to a scene. Like just on the way you light a scene, it can, ha it can make a scene have a completely different vibe for the viewers. And uh, my skills, I guess, got recognized by the teacher. There were other really talented students in that same class, uh, one of whom I partnered up with and uh, we entered um, a competition called Skills Canada. We were a two-person team like the first tier of the competition was um, at the regional level. And uh, teams of two students from different cities would all get together in one city, in one computer lab of one particular school, and compete against one another in trying to create a 3D animated short film under in X amount of hours. I can't remember what the time limit was, but it was like, I don't know, maybe six hours, something like that eight hours and each team had that amount of hours to like story to to conceive a short film storyboard it and then animate it with um, 3d studio max me and the same guy entered the same competition a couple of years in a row and each time we actually won the regional level we got either like a silver or i think one year we got bronze and the other year we got gold and both times we were elevated to the uh, provincial level of the competition. And that took place at this big, like, convention center. We never made it past that, though. I think we came close, but um, no cigar. And uh, believe it or not, as grade 12 approached, I decided of my own accord to stay for an extra year. Now why, John, why would you do that? You say you hate school so much, but you voluntarily chose to attend an extra year? What was that for? Are you high? Well, that extra year was to be spent studying nothing but um, university-level computer courses. These courses were basically training courses for A-plus certification, which means you are a uh, certified computer technician, and you can 
be hired for like home repairs and stuff like that. Like it's a certificate that tells people you know what you're doing. I never ended up taking the exam for the A-plus certification, but I had all the training required to completely complete the exam. The only reason I didn't take the exam was like there was a fee attached to it, like over a hundred dollars to take the exam. And I fucking, that makes my teeth itch when I see like, oh, you, you got to pay us money to take our exam. Fuck you. I'll get by on my own then. And that really didn't go anywhere. Like I, even though I didn't have the certification, I got hired at one point by an elderly couple. I went to their house and they were having problems with their computer. And that was kind of a learning experience because I learned, I got a sense of perspective on the part of the elderly, like their perspective on technology. Like the way they kind of pieced together things, the way they understood how computers worked. Like the the couple that hired me, they thought that all like the computer's data and stuff was stored in the monitor. And that, that might be true for computers that came years later, like iMacs and stuff. But this was like a, this was an old style like IBM with a, like a CRT monitor. There was nothing in that monitor except the electronics required to make the display work. Like, all the stuff was in the tower, the hard drive, the, the motherboard, all that. But they didn't understand that. They they just thought that tower was just kind of a useless accessory box, I guess. I don't know. That's where all the fish tackles are. <laughs> That's where we keep our Werther's Originals. You want one? I did some practicum work at a technology store. I worked, like, in the tech department, like, behind the room behind the computer counter where the techs would be and they would take in customers like computer towers and scan them for viruses, quote unquote, fix their computers, right? And, you know, if you never set foot in there, it kind of has this uh, mystical aura about it. Like, you know, oh, the wizards, like those Apple geniuses, fucking bullshit. Like these all-knowing wizard-like figures who can like, take a computer and wave a fucking magic wand and it's it's clean of of all ailment and it can function properly after that but then I was actually in that room doing that job and most of the time it was just like checking the history of their internet browser to see whether or not there was any porn and then calling the customer at home and you know the wife would usually pick up and then one of us in the tech room basically had to say over and over uh, we think you're, there's there's porn on your computer, so the implication is like, your husband's a filthy bastard. And other than that, all we were doing is just doing re- reinstallations of Windows. Which is so fucking easy. But so many people don't realize how easy it is, or was back then. I mean, it's it's been made much easier now. But back then, it had this like illusion that it was this complicated thing, but it really wasn't. All you had to do really was just put the Windows operating system disk in and hit one of the F keys, I can't remember what, and you just boot from the disk instead of the hard drive, and you just run Windows setup and let it do its thing. It's something you could easily fucking do at home, but these tech teams in these stores were charging customers like 50 bucks to fix their computers, and this is all they were doing. It's like, this is stuff they could easily do on their own. So that was kind of a learning experience for me, like the power of bullshit and, you know, The more secluded you are, the more mystique there is, and the more people think that you must be doing grand, mysterious things when you're really not doing that much at all. So yeah, I took those courses in high school. I understood how I understood how computers processed information and communicated with each other at a fundamental level. Like I understood binary and how to convert from binary to decimal and hexadecimal. And I was taking apart computers and studying all the individual components and putting computers back together. I knew how to, I learned how to ground myself properly, like electrically, so I could work with the components. That was all really valuable stuff because it demystified the whole realm of computers for me. Like I used, I was the kind of guy who used to be afraid of the idea of opening up my computer unless, you know, in case I'd fuck something up. Or I'd break something. But it's really something people shouldn't be scared of. In fact, people should really know how computers work, especially in this day and age. You have such an advantage over people if you know how to, like, hack 
other networks and people's computers. Like if you know how computers work, there's a lot of people out there who don't and they're so easily taken advantage of. That's why uh, I love that show Mr. Robot so much on the USA Network. Season 2 is about to premiere soon. And that show doesn't fuck around. Like it shows you exactly how it is. And it's, it's scary because it's all stuff that can be achieved through modern technology. And I understood like handshake protocols and how computers communicate with one another. And I, I learned how to configure routers and uh, I knew about all, I learned all about IP addresses and subnet masks and wild masks and all this shit. I mean, I forget a lot of this shit now. But back then, I was pretty savvy, man. I learned the power of the command prompt. Like, you can do pretty much anything through the command prompt. It's like it's the DOS, right? Disk operating system. It is an operating system. The only difference between that and like something like Windows is that Windows has a graphical user interface that's, you know, makes it easy for anybody to like, you know, see things and click on them. The command prompt has that same kind of power, but it's just all text based. There's no graphical user interface, so you got to know exactly what to type in. You got to know the syntax. You got to know all the commands that you can put in. Like just by entering one line in the command prompt, even on a student account, you could shut down every computer remotely in the entire classroom. And nobody could stop it from shutting down unless they knew the line to type into the command prompt to disable it. I think there was a quote from Steve Jobs where he was saying, like, everybody should learn how to build a computer or something. It, it teaches you how to think. It wasn't exactly that. It was along those lines, right? If you know about computers, you understand how the human brain works. It teaches you to think logically when you understand computers and how they communicate with one another and how data is stored and retrieved. You, you take that knowledge and you, you apply it subconsciously to your real life and you learn to think about things in a logical manner and put emotion aside. It helps you think critically to, to, to comprehend all that computer shit. And so taking those courses felt really valuable and I'm glad I did that. And then, you know, graduation came along and um, prom and all that. That was a fucking nightmare. That's a story on its own. I remember my high school graduation and getting my degree and then as soon as that was over just basically jumping on a bus that took all the students to like a boat for this grad cruise that I didn't even really want to go on because I didn't have anybody to hang out with. I didn't have a date. I don't know. I just I guess I caved into this pressure like you know I should I should really make the best of this moment and you know and, and take because, you know, you don't graduate every day and, you know, there's this cruise happening. Like, I'm going to remember this forever. Maybe something good will happen. So, you know, I decided to do it. And it had its highlights. I remember I was um, a part of a poker game. And by some fluke, I had a great hand and I won the pot. And I remember some girls showing a little bit of interest in me right after that. Because I had won. Because I guess they thought, like, oh, I was such a good poker player. I didn't have a fucking clue what I was doing. I didn't know how to play poker. Like, I understood the basics, but, you know, the, the one of the essential components of playing poker is knowing the hands and what hand beats what. And I had no fucking clue. I just put my cards down, and then other people were looking at my cards, and, you know, they, they're the ones who knew what all, all the hands were. And they were like, oh, he won the game. And so for a brief second there, you know, I felt like the shit, you know, even though I really did nothing to warrant it. I was like, I'm going to enjoy this moment. But it didn't last long because, you know, before I knew it, I was out alone on the deck, just staring out into the water. Nobody really talked to me. I didn't put myself out there, didn't talk to anybody, and it just ended up being this miserable experience. And I was like, God, I should just jump off the fucking boat. Hopefully the propeller on the fucking engine will suck me in and then, you know, I don't have to deal with this crazy fiasco called life anymore. And uh, on my prom night, during the dry grad which is like the, the after party after like all the dancing and the cake and bullshit, whatever. And dry means no alcohol, which means no fucking fun. So it was a dry grad and we're in this like rollerblade arena that's been converted into this like amusement park with all these like inflatable rides, like obstacle courses. Like there was one 
where it was just a square, inflatable, bouncy castle thing, and two people would go in and play laser tag, like they had the vests and the guns and shit. And there was another inflatable obstacle course thing, where like two people would each simultaneously climb into like either side of this obstacle course that was like mirrored, and they would climb through and make their way up to the top and then converge and slide down this big slide in the middle. And I had done that, and I didn't put any socks on. So I, like, I was in my bare feet. And so when I went down the slide, I tore, like, three ligaments in my ankle on the way down, just, like, spiraling down, screaming, ah! Finally getting to the bottom. And, you know, it was just like that, that scene in Family Guy, you know, with Peter Griffin, who, like, he, he gets Willy Wonka's golden ticket or whatever, and he trips on the sidewalk, and he bangs his knee, and he's just clutching his knee, and then for, like, five minutes, he's just, like, rocking back and forth, going, that was me just like clutching my ankle sucking in oxygen through my teeth and then they wheeled me out into the hallway and they offered me oxygen but I thought oh, everybody's watching they're gonna think I'm a pussy so I denied the oxygen I said no thanks I'm fine and then they loaded me onto a stretcher and then wheeled me into a fucking ambulance and drove me to the hospital and I was wheeled into the ER and then I got x-rays done my mom came in to meet me and then she saw me in there in the fucking stretcher with my busted ankle and she just started laughing and I started laughing so you know I had a bum foot for a while and for a little while it looked fucking disgusting like it was just this my ankle was just this disgusting massive bruised flesh I remember every morning was fucking agony because you know I'd be lying flat on my back for eight hours and you know it would even out the blood level in my body uh. but then you know I'd have to wake up and set my feet on the ground and then gravity would push all the blood to my feet and then all of a sudden my ankle would be in fucking agony so it took me like a half hour of wincing every morning you know just to get out of the fucking bedroom and so you know I was on my ass a lot of that time for like a good two months I don't know but I remember that was a pivotal moment for me because that's when I really got immersed in the internet because I was on my ass for so long and I started finding out about these websites like YTMND, You're the Man Now Dog. And it was so stupid, but I loved it. And, and it was like a community on the, like I suddenly realized, saw the internet. It's like, oh, this is a place where like, like people can kind of hang out and like exchange this absurd kind of humor and just, you know, laugh at life and share their negative share their negative stories and transform their negative energy into something positive. And so I really got into YTMND and, you know, Newgrounds and 4chan and Encyclopedia Dramatica and stuff like that. I found out about Live Leak and all the graphic horrendous shit that's on there. I don't think it was too long after that actually that I started uh, making Arby and the Chief or not Mar not Arby and the Chief but Master Chief sucks at Halo which eventually became Arby and the Chief. I did, like, three successive episodes. Master Chief sucks at Halo 1, 2, and 3. And it was just, like, Master Chief playing Xbox online and swearing and trash talking and calling everybody faggots and retards. You know, pretty much what gaming was back then. Online gaming. I don't know if you guys remember, but around the time, like, Halo 2 came out and everybody was playing online on Xbox, I just remember online gaming at that time being this, like, horrendous offensive volatile farce there was not one room one server you could possibly join that didn't have some shithead calling everybody fags or hacking i gotta say i missed that though i actually liked that i just thought that was so fucking funny that people would get so angry online on a video game the idea of trolling was hilarious to me so as soon as i was out of high school there was this immediate pressure to get right into post-secondary from family you know I guess there was this fear that you know if I took a year off I would be too distracted and not want to ever go back and that very well might have been the case because I'm like I fucking hated this experience I'm glad I'm out I don't want to jump back in grades and homework and shit and having to show up for class early still and at least now that I was in the post-secondary education phase, I could start specializing. Like, I could, I could start zoning in on a particular area of education that would be relevant to the career that I wanted. 
and I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do at that time, but I knew that it had to be in the entertainment industry somehow because I dreaded the idea of having what you would typically consider to be a nine to five job. Like I didn't want an office job. I didn't want to work in the food industry. I didn't want to work retail. I did work for retail for a while and I learned to hate it. I'm like, Jesus, there's nothing I can do that would like that I'd be happy doing except unless I'm doing some kind of creative work in the entertainment industry whether it be television or animation or film or video games at the time I thought video games cuz like I loved video games and you know that was that was one of my main things in life you know playing that shit and you know I had some modest experience in game design myself like just working on my own stuff like I was playing around with Macromedia Flash and if you go on newgrounds.com and you search for a game called Day of the Living Dicks that is a game that I made in which you play as a bald preschooler with a handgun shooting giant dicks that would jump, like, leap across the ground and attack you. And there was even, like, RPG elements. Like, I made a menu that you could bring up and you could level up certain attributes. And once, like, you leveled up, once, like, you leveled up your jump height, high enough you could jump to a certain part of the stage that would reveal a sign with like a cheat code on it and you could go back to the main menu and put that cheat code in and would and it would unlock all these game breaking cheats like you know moon jump and infinite ammo and health and you know low gravity and stuff so i thought you know i am going back to school but at least i'll be studying something that interests me this time that'll be of my choosing which is which was game design so I enrolled myself in an institution that taught that that had a program for game design specifically but uh, I didn't stick with it for too long maybe a term maybe two it was a little too computery and theory heavy like I just wanted to get on the computers and use the game making software and make shit and you know compile all the code on the fly and jump into the level and look around and see oh what does it look like oh I gotta fix that I gotta fix that jump back out into the software interface and fix whatever it is like I love doing that shit I, I did that shit at home with with different kinds of software I think it was around the end of my first term where I was contacted by uh, machinima.com to produce Arby and the Chief well not specifically to produce that but they were saying hey we'll pay you to create content and that was the show I came up with because th the reason they had found out about me in the first place was because Master Chief Sucks at Halo 3 uh, had gone viral. It has like 10 million views now or something ridiculous like that. So yeah, it was Master Chief Sucks at Halo 3. So I had made three of them. And I had done that, you know, just as a hobby. Like I thought it would be kind of funny. And, you know, it satirized how hostile the online gaming world was. And, I, you know, I thought it was so funny to play online and listen to people trash talk and I wanted to make fun of that and that's kinda how Master Chief came into existence you know that character because I had the toy there and beforehand I had been playing around with Microsoft Sam because I was exploring the fine details of Windows 95 and XP and I learned about the the text-to-speech voice engines and Microsoft Sam and Mike was, were there but I was only using Microsoft Sam at the time because Master Chief was the only character I had conceived at the time. I just wanted to make a short film about him playing online and cussing everybody out. So that trilogy of videos was basically just a, like a sequences of gags with the narrative not really... I guess there was some narrative in mind, but it wasn't the plot wasn't that much of a priority. It was just getting the jokes out. And even in the first season of Arby and the Chief, that was true. I didn't really care much about the plot. I just wanted, it was just a vehicle for jokes, really. But since I got the job offer and I was going to be paid for it, and, you know, this was going to be, like, advertised and stuff, I wanted to make a good job of it and flesh it out. So I thought, okay, like, the big thing, I decided, like, the big thing this show needs is a foil to Master Chief. Somebody, somebody who's rational and grounded and can basically act as the protective glass between the audience and Master Chief, this this outrageously offensive, homophobic, misogynist character. And I think turning that show into like a comedy double act between those two characters, Arbiter and Master Chief, was 
like the best thing I could have done for that show. You know, I'm proud of that. The fact that they're polar opposites and they, they dig so much into each other and they, they, they get the best out of one another in terms of anger and jokes and, you know, funny dialogue and stuff. So I did that for a while and I was making pretty good money and I stopped going to school for a little while after that. But I picked up my post-secondary education again a little bit later and started going to, like part-time to various institutions to take like, you know, a couple courses part-time to, to collect credits that hopefully were transferable to other institutions. At one institution I took uh, English and Psychology. I don't recall too much about that other than one English class like the the teacher like chewed me out a little bit in front of the class for like writing the phrase in one of my essays nine times out of ten like I was making some generalized statement in my argument and just saying nine times out of ten as kind of a figurative like a figure of speech not as a statistic 90 percent but that's kind of the way this teacher interpreted it and, you know, he was kind of making a joke about it in front of the whole class. Like, nine times out of ten, where did you get that figure from, John? What uh, what academic source did you pull that 90% stat from? Kind of thing, you know? I was like, what the fuck? What are you picking on me for? It's just a... It's just a figure of speech. That's all I meant by it. I mean, okay, I probably could have worded it better in hindsight. But why don't you just wait until after the class and then take five minutes to talk to me about it? Why do you have to... You gotta broadcast this in this tone that suggests that what I'm, my writing is fucking ridiculous. And I went to this other college campus to take uh, short story and poetry writing. And I remember my teacher there was kind of a hard ass. I think she was a little full of herself because like the majority of the other students were Korean. Who were like, who seemed mostly timid and didn't really have a strong grasp of the English language so you know I guess if you're a teacher and you're teaching nothing but students like that you would develop kind of an inflated sense of authority wouldn't you and as soon as I got that vibe from her I immediately got pissed off I'm like god here we go again more fucking conceited teachers as if I didn't have enough of that shit in grade school god just get me away from these people you know I looked at my phone one day at class for like a second because I got like an email from work because I was under Machinima's employee at the time and it was some programming note, I think, or something. And then I look up from my phone at her and she's just staring daggers into me, shaking her head from side to side. Like I had just done the worst thing in the world. Like I was a dog and I just stole a biscuit, you know what I mean? No, we, no, 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 we don't do that. We don't do that here. Fuck you, I was looking at my phone, all right? I'm paying to be here. You know, it's my time to piss away, you know what I mean? If I'm not paying attention, just carry on with the fucking lesson. Don't mind me. You do your thing. Don't stare me down with this angry attitude like I'm a fucking preschooler. Sorry, is this not post-secondary? I thought we were all, like, supposed to be on a first-name basis. On, like, equal levels. Other than you're teaching me things. But beyond that, we're, like, we're supposed to be peers, aren't we? Some of these post-secondary teachers, they gotta, they gotta keep being fucking reminded of this over and over. And if they're not for a while, then that ego takes over. Then they turn into a fucking sheep herder barking at all the students. That was another eye-opener for me because um, I learned that the, like the Korean students who were in that same class as me, some of them, in order to like come here for an education, they had to go through like military school or training or something like that. And that really gave me a sense of perspective. I was like, wow, I'm pretty... Like, here I am bitching about this, you know, the education system and all that, but I am lucky to have it at my fingertips and not have to join the fucking military in order to get an education. But everybody fights their own battle in life, you know? Everybody has the things in their life that make them feel like shit, you know? Things that, you know, if other people were to hear about them, they might just laugh and say, that's nothing to get worked up about. By the time high school was over, I was just done with it, you know? I was just done of getting graded. Con like, having all my work constantly assessed. So after that came uh, film school. But, bef but just before that, um, I remember I received a job offer at that point. And it was from 
a game development company in Quebec, and they were looking to um, hire staff for a core narrative team that would develop a brand new IP. I can't remember the developer, but they were actually a developer I respected. Like, I went on their website, and I saw their, like, list of games, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember playing that. That was cool. That was cool. The name is escaping me. I apologize. I can't remember. But here I was, living in BC, getting an offer to relocate myself to Quebec, a place that is 99% Quebecois. You know, everybody would speak French. Like, I would, there would be a real sense of uh, feeling alienated, I mean, at least at first. And I don't know how good I would be at picking up, you know, the French language. Because they say, like, if you're just, if you're thrown into an environment like that, you do end up picking up the language. But I don't know how good I would be at that. I mean, I severely doubt my abilities to ever grasp a second language. And that was a really scary thing. You know, is this what I really want? On one hand, it would be so alienating, but... I would get to work on an, as part of a narrative team on a brand new IP for this developer that actually has a decent body of work behind them. Like this is like almost the dream. Like I wasn't quite sure if that's what I wanted to do in life yet. But I mean, it was the closest thing. Like writing for a video game? Hell yeah. Controlling the story and what the players experience? Like there's a real opportunity to to craft a cool story there and maybe possibly a great game. I don't know what that game ended up being or, or if it ever was released. They never told me the name of the IP. They just said it was a new IP they were developing and that was it. So it was either that or stay where I was and go to film school. And that's ultimately what I ended up doing because I was just too scared of relocating myself. I didn't want to uproot like that. Because once I got myself all moved over there, I could just see myself sitting in my new apartment all fucking depressed. Like, oh god, why did, why did I think this was a good idea? I feel so fucking alone here, I can't talk to anybody. <laughs> I remember during, like, some interview process, uh, I was asking, like, are there any, like, restaurants, you know, local to where I would be living? And the guy was like, well, there's McDonald's. Like, oh, great. McDicks. ba da ba 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 I'm loving it. Am I, am I supposed to eat fucking Big Macs every day? <laughs> That'd be funny if I moved over there purely on the fact that McDonald's would be nearby. It's like, oh, God, 99% Quebecois. I'll never fit in. But, hey, there's a fucking McDonald's right there. So, hey, I'm, I'm going to buy my plane ticket right now. Because I want, I'm going to go to them golden arches and get myself a fucking happy meal. Mm-mm. Do I want a toy with that? Hell yeah, I do. I want to collect them all. Give me five happy meals. However many toys there are. Give me that many. <clears throat> okay. How are we all feeling so far? Good? I feel good. What was what noise? I didn't hear anything. You got to get your ears checked, guys. Okay? So for the first time ever on this podcast, get ready, guys. It's time for fan mail. Let's read some fan mail, okay? Here we go. Let's go. All right, let's do this. Listen up. Listen up, okay? Question on Arby and the Chief post season 8. After you finish season 8 as it's supposed to be the last season, would that be it for the show or are you planning on continuing it in ways that don't really pertain to the main plot like bites or even hypermail. P.S. Give me one life remaining season three. Love, Chris. Uh, in regard to one life remaining, no. That is one of my, one of the first machinima series I ever created before Arby and the Chief. And uh, I'm not too happy with it, as most of my fans will know. Looking back on it, I just think the writing and the story completely clashes with the visuals, and it's just so disharmonious to watch. I don't know, it just makes my teeth itch looking back on it, so I don't, really. One guy wanted to adapt it into a live play at his school or something. I was like, well, like I'm flattered you think it's that good. I don't know, I just can't see it that way. It's, it's really hard for me to appreciate it. But hey, I'm glad there's people out there who like it. 
but I just don't like talking about it that much. Um, as for R being the chief, um, in terms of an overall narrative, yeah, I want this season to be the last one. But no, that doesn't mean it's necessarily the end of me doing like Bites episodes and stuff like that, because those, those relatively don't take too long relative to the main episodes, which take a long time to write. Uh. And, you know, they're fun to do, and they're a great way to get like a quick, relevant gag out, you know, that might relate to something that's going on in current events. So, so yeah, I don't want to say, no, I won't, because chances are, you know, I probably will want to make like a bite episode now and then, because, you know, I have something in my head that I think is funny that, you know, that's related to the gaming industry somehow. You know, they can be quite fun to do. Do you like Crab Rangoon? I don't even know what the fuck that is. Hey, John, really looking forward to this podcast of yours. Should be both fun and insightful. Anyway, I have a topic suggestion for you, television writing. Our Being the Chief is structured like a television show, and I was wondering if you can go in-depth about television writing. Um, that might make for a good podcast topic on its own, but uh, to briefly touch on it, yeah. Our Being the Chief, especially like as, as it went on, as the seasons went on, it was definitely heavily inspired by shows I was watching at the time, like Dexter and Breaking Bad and The Sopranos. I remember it was actually season four of Dexter that really got me thinking seriously about structure and how satisfying structure would make a season of television. Like, it got me really pumped, like the, like the cliffhangers at the end of each episode and how the show was so hyper-serialized. And then by the end of the second last episode, it felt like, whoa, this is the tipping point, holy shit. And then the finale is just all out chaos. And I really dug that. And that's something that I wanted to bring into my own show was that kind of, that excitement for each successive episode because of the way it's narratively structured. And there's like a big payoff at the end of each episode that keeps you hooked. That to me was way more exciting than like the, you know, a traditional joke centered show that, you know, each episode is very self-contained and everything would reset at the beginning of each episode. Like the world would be reset, like Dark Souls almost. It's like nothing ever happened. And so each episode would like become increasingly ridiculous until the third act is just unbelievably outrageous and then things would go back to normal like Family Guy or something like that. But I really like the idea of keeping the action grounded in reality and stretching a story over time and making it like not the kind of show where you could just jump in at any point. Like it's a show where you have to start watching from episode one and onward in order to understand what's happening. Shows like that hook my attention far more than shows with uh, self-contained episodes. Like I was a big fan of House at one point. I loved House. I just loved that character. But eventually, but the show was just that it had such a formulaic way in which it was told that eventually I just lost interest. Like after season five was over, or after season six, I think, I just stopped watching because it felt like, you know, the the premiere and the finale were the only two episodes really worth watching in terms of moving the story of House, the character, forward. You know, and every other episode in between was just like, oh, you know, the, the patient, the absurd patient of the week that has some quirk. And, you know, House, three quarters of the way through the episode, does something seemingly irrelevant to the A plot. And then all of, all of a sudden has a revelation like, oh, I know what's wrong with my patient now. Why didn't I see it before? Like that Sherlock Holmes kind of revelation moment. I don't mind so much the timing of those plot points. Like that's just traditional storytelling 101. But it just became so repetitive over time that, you know, my attention just wasn't hooked anymore. But a show where, you know, characters and the environments they're in are constantly changing and evolving. Those are the kind of shows where you want to watch until the very end, right? That's what Breaking Bad did. That's why that was so genius. That's what Game of Thrones does. And that's a very hard thing to do, to have a show like Game of Thrones where there's so many primary characters... And making them all interesting and have their own meaningful arcs and extreme character transformations and having those arcs, you know, bounce off one another and intertwine and, you know, affect the plot in really meaningful ways. 
Like that's why that guy George R. R. Martin is considered like a genius. The guy is a fucking genius, I think. And you know, The Sopranos, which was just like groundbreaking television when that came out. It was just like a constantly evolving narrative that was changing all the time. And you know, there's nothing necessarily wrong with formulaic shows. I mean, like Seinfeld is one of my favorite shows of all time, but you just you got to be in the mood for that type of show. And and the hook of shows like that is the comedy, like a show that keeps you laughing all the time, consistently, even if narratively it's not that compelling. You keep, you keep tuning in week after week because you get those like belly laughs, right? And I guess I wanted to do a show that did both. Like I I really like the mixture of like comedy and horror. And you know, keeping the action grounded in reality and you know, intense. Because as soon as something unbelievable happens, funny as it may be, like that, you know, that might be a decision purely for, you know, the gag, the joke. Like, as, but as soon as something ridiculous happens in the plot, all tension is eliminated. And I, like, personally, I immediately lose interest because I like tension in the media that I watch. Let's uh, move on here. Let's see what other mail we got here. Sometimes my parents beat me. My question is, I am, am I a freak if I secretly enjoy it? Thanks. Uh, hamster face, you know, or lion face, or whatever, however you want to say it, colon three. P.S. Longtime fan of Arby and the Chief. Great show, and I love the latest episode. Very original. That's kind of, I don't know if you're joking or not, dude. That's pretty heavy if you're not. Um, are you a freak if you secretly enjoy it? I mean, I'm going to assume you're joking here okay so if I sound insensitive here I'm sorry but you know at this point in my career it's hard not to take anything any fans say to me through email or Twitter or whatever you know it's hard not for me to take anything they say as a joke at face value so are you a freak if you secretly enjoy it no I wouldn't describe you as a freak I would just describe you as somebody with like a domination fetish or a pain fetish and, you know, there's people like that out there. And they were born that way, and that's not their fault. I don't think anybody should be condemned for things that are beyond their control. That's why I think homophobia is stupid. That's why I think racism is stupid. That's why I think it's okay to, like, make jokes about those things, because they are jokes in and of themselves. It's, like, perfect ground for comedy. That's why I'm not afraid to, like, make jokes like that. Because I feel I can justify it. When I say jokes like that, it's not coming from a place of hatred. And that's really what all art and comedy and whatever comes down to is intent, right? Even cinema. Like, it's about figuring out the intent of the director. And my intent is to entertain people. Like, I know there's going to be perfectly reasonable people listening to this podcast who had a terrific time at school. And they're like, an education is so valuable. What the fuck are you bitching about, John? Shut up. But, you know, I feel like I still reserve my right to bitch about it just because it was so horrifying for me. It was so horrifying. Like, I'm never going to be okay. I'm never going to look back on that and be okay with it. Oh, yeah, that was fine. Just felt this, just felt like this gigantic thorn in my ass, just this giant blanket in my life for 20 years, just suffocating me. And it's just towards the end of it. It's just like, get off. Let me get some air, for Christ's sake. <gasps> you know what I mean? Come back here, John. I just got to grade that, that, that piece of work you did with my little felt pen. Cram it up your ass, teacher I made up. Who I wouldn't actually say this to because it's easy to sound gangsta on a podcast. From the comfort of my bedroom behind my computer monitors. And you know, that's, that's a big part of what Arby and the Chief was about. That kind of aggression that gamers exhibit and that kind of unfiltered dialogue that comes from them that normally wouldn't come from them because it's filtered through this anonymity of the internet. And, you know, they feel like they can say whatever they want to whoever they want and get people riled up with the sole purpose of getting them riled up and then laughing at them for getting riled up. That's it. That's, that's like... A lot of the time, that's like the sole justification. And that's that fascinated me. 
I thought it was so funny. I wa- and I wanted to make a show about it. And I felt like no, no other show was really getting it right. Like other machinima shows I was checking out at the time, I can't remember really any names. But just the dialogue seemed so... It was funny, but it was like so tame. And then you'd actually, and then I'd actually play online, jump on a Halo Two online, and everybody's calling each other faggots and queers all the time. And it's like well, this is so hostile. This is so funny, but I'm not seeing that reflected in, you know, any kind of show. So I was like, I want to, I want to make a show that shows what it's like, that you know, that portrays the, these people and these attitudes for what they are. Because there is value in an honest reflection of what reality is. I think that's really what makes good television. Making it authentic. As, as bleak and offensive as it might be, it's like you've got to listen to it because this is what's happening. This is what kids are being exposed to when they go and play online. This is what they're hearing. And there's no escaping it because it's, you know, the internet. It's, it's like the Wild West. I mean, I think it's gotten a lot less hostile. But for a while there, man, it was bad. Uh. All right, it's time to wrap things up here. Uh, Thank you very much for tuning in. This was episode two of the See Me After Class podcast with John Graham. Uh, I remember my show, RB and the Chief. I'm currently producing an eighth season. You can check out my YouTube channel. My username is John CJG. Um... If you want to support the show, if you want to support this podcast and receive uh, bonus episodes, um, go check out my Patreon page at uh, patreon.com slash jcjgram. Check out the reward tiers, um, throw me a couple bucks, and uh, get a little something in return on top of the, you know, the episodes of the show and, you know, the free, like I'm going to, I'm going to release free episodes per month and bonus episodes per month, like every other week. So it's like if you're... If you're a backer, then it's like weekly. And for the public, it's bi-monthly, so twice a month, every other week. And you can check out my website at imaginativelogo.com where you'll find links to uh, the podcast and Arby and the Chief and all the episodes from past seasons. You know, they're all they're all on machinima.com's channel, but I my website has links to all the episodes. And there's some goodies on there, and you can see there's some links to my other channels and my Twitch account if you want to add me on Twitch. I do commentary streams on the episodes, and early access to those is one of the backer rewards. So if that's something that interests you, you can consider helping me out. Um, I also make music tracks. I mean, nothing that great. They're pretty repetitive, but, uh, you know, it's catchy background music tracks for the show. It's a good alternative to paying licensing fees for, you know, stock music. But uh, that, along with the podcast episodes, are all on my SoundCloud account, johncjg-420-69. That is not a joke, because fuckers keep taking my johncjg username on, like, popular websites that require you to create an account. Because they saw johncjg mentioned or written on the show at some point, and then they decided to take that username for themselves. And then I go on that website trying to create my fucking account. I can't even pick my own name. So I gotta come up with some derivative bullshit like John CJG42069. Anyway, that's my SoundCloud page. And uh, one last thing, if you've got some questions for me to answer on the show, or if you have ideas for possible topics, you know, for me to discuss on the show, you can shoot an email to afterclasspodcast at gmail.com. That's afterclasspodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you next time.